Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. My guest today, Spencer Ackerman, is the author of the new book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. The book offers an intense examination of how a never-ending war on terror became a deeply embedded and malignant force in American civic life. Reign of Terror is one of the most important foreign policy books of a generation. It will change how you think about the relationship between foreign policy and domestic politics. And for those of us in the United States, the book challenges us to reckon with policies that we have long tolerated and now accept as normal. I could not more highly recommend this book. It is essential reading for any student of American foreign policy. I'll post a link to it in the show notes of this episode and on the website. Spencer Ackerman and I came up in similar journalism circles in the early 2000s. I was a great admirer of his work then, as I am now. Spencer Ackerman is a Pulitzer Prize-winning and National Magazine Award-winning reporter who has worked for Wired, The Guardian, The Daily Beast, and is now the publisher of the Forever Wars newsletter on Substack. This is a great conversation that I hope inspires you to buy the book. And as always, feel free to reach out to me. If there's anything on your mind, you can hit me up on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg or send me an email using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. Send me your story ideas. I'd love to hear from you. All right, now here is my conversation with journalist Spencer Ackerman, author of Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Before we get into a position to talk about the institutional architecture of the national security state that gets either expanded, repurposed, or in some cases outright built after 9-11, the wellspring for all of this is the metaphysical definitions of what 9-11 was and what it represented that George W. Bush launches into immediately. He reaches for the language of good and evil for explanations for 9-11 that seek to balm the American conscience rather than contextualize 9-11 historically. And of course, that becomes a weapon to use against those who would textualize it historically. 9-11 becomes a cancel culture extremely quickly, as someone like Susan Sontag found out for those who are not willing to interpret 9-11 as a struggle epically of good versus evil, of freedom sworn people being under siege for their love and exercise of freedom. And the significance of that really is quite profound because the implications extend so widely so as to funnel the response the U.S. takes after 9-11 down a path of expansive war rather than down a path of either targeted military, targeted law enforcement operations against a specific conspiracy of people, um, or alternatively or in supplement, dealing with the existence of an American empire politically, economically, socially, and the according existence of its violent discontents, which happens all throughout history. And I think when looking at it like that, how quickly the war on terror is foreordained after 9-11, that's something that ever since a lot of us had a difficult time conceptualizing differently, that all of this 
was a political choice, however much our leaders framed it at the time as an inevitability. Our journalistic figures, our journalistic elites framed it as an inevitability, that war is the only option, that this kind of war maybe can be debated about its, you know, about maybe, maybe what can be debated is this or that application of military force, or maybe this or that uh, application of a surveillance expansion, but not the thing itself, not the construct, the existence of a war, and not even a war just against Al-Qaeda, but a more expansive war. That language of metaphysics uh, starts us all down that path, and we've been on that path for an entire generation. And there is also just thinking back to that era. I mean, there's no nuance, right? When you're good versus evil, it doesn't allow for any sort of dispassionate understanding of what led to 9-11. I was thinking about how I would answer the question that I asked you more discreetly, and I landed on the color-coded Homeland Security alerts. Ah. Uh, Folks that are are perhaps too young, maybe in their 20s or 30s, might not remember this, but there was this bizarre moment. It lasted, I don't know, several years uh, in which the Department of Homeland Security, you know, which itself was a creation after 9-11, which itself is like a, just a very bizarre thing to think about in retrospect, um, you know, would have, you'd have like orange days or yellow days, depending on how scared the security state wanted to make you feel that day. And that just preying on people's very genuine fears at the time seemed to be something that the Bush administration exploited so, so well. You know, something else I would add to that, um, you know, not only did those, you know, color-coded stacked boxes of fear uh, exist for seven years, seven years, but, you know, Everyone who's kind of come of age or born after 9-11 will not be able to understand that we used to not use the term homeland. Like that weird Teutonic, like nativist sounding term uh, was just not part of the American vocabulary. And if, you know, someone used it, that sent up like red flags about like, what is this person's agenda? Um, And now it's entirely normal. And another thing I would add about the color coded stacked boxes of fear is that in a real perfect, you know, metaphor slash vignette slash microcosm of the Obama administration's relationship to the war on terror. One of the first things they do is get rid of those, you know, stupid boxes. But they keep ICE. They keep CBP. They keep the Department of Homeland Security. And that, to me, is, um, while I don't use that specific metaphor in the book, that kind of sums up the approach I take to understanding uh, the Obama administration and its relationship Uh, to the war on terror um, toward the middle of sections of the book. Yeah. So you use a fascinating term to describe uh, Obama's relationship to the war on terror. You call it the sustainable war on terror. What did you mean by that term and how did you choose it to describe Obama's approach? Yeah. So that's not a term the Obama people like put on their own stuff. That's, That's something I am using. And the reason why I use it is because if you look at years and years and years of Barack Obama's speeches about terrorism and those of his of his chief aides, you know, the way Jay Johnson, who is Secretary of Homeland Security in the second administration, uses it, John Brennan, the most important of all of Obama's counterterrorism aides, who's White House counterterrorism chief in the first administration and CIA director in the second. Eric Holder, who's attorney general for most of the administration, people like that, they talk about 
about putting the war on a s- sustainable footing, meaning that they they kind of import this language of sustainability that exists, you know, across liberalism and particularly like upper middle class liberalism, uh, where the language is of something that as long as it can be uh, guarded against exceeding its boundaries um, is ultimately uh, like healthy and valorous and the proper focus uh, of someone and importing such an enterprise is on ensuring that like the boundaries of sustainability are not violated. So what would be like an example of, of that in practice in the Obama administration? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, what you, what, what then becomes somewhat obscured is that, you know, sustaining a war is immoral. The, the whole enterprise when thought of in terms of sustainability is an enterprise that continues to persist. What Obama tries to do is kind of wrap it in this belt of process, whereby for things like drone strikes, uh, an exceptionally uh, important committee um, inside the executive branch security bureaucracy essentially meets to nominate people to execute and various agencies within the security bureaucracy through senior officials, you know, further and further up the chain, deliberate, consider, and then take action when they believe that, you know, such people are, are present. And that is the routinization and bureaucratization of a mechanism of mass killing. And the people who engage in it believe themselves to be lawful. They believe themselves to be more lawful than their predecessors who lacked that process. But consider that this isn't a judicial process. It's not an adversarial process. It's not a legal process. What it is doing is importing precedent, bureaucratic muscle memory and practices, best practices, from across the different security bureaucracy as it's become accustomed to killing, and then when necessary, applies law-like concepts, but not in circumstances that stop the enterprise, only in circumstances that bound it. And what it considers bounding it is really quite capacious in a very ominous way. Ultimately, in 2010, it permits the assassination of an American citizen just because the CIA says it would be too hard to capture that person. The same CIA that lied to the same Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush administration about the necessity and efficacy of torture. And this process, now presided over by people who criticized those decisions, allow a drone strike against an American citizen. And once you have such a process, first off, its operations are in secret. When the father of the person, uh, the American citizen, uh, targeted for execution, uh, Anwar al-Awlaki, who is himself radicalized by the war on terror, seeks to sue, to injunct the government from killing his son, What the Justice Department files back is a convenient lie that, oh, you know, while it it stops, it steps back from kind of the threshold of the outright lie. But nevertheless, what it says is that, you know, just because you read in the newspaper that we're trying to kill this guy, that doesn't mean we are. We're not confirming that. And if this person cannot prove that we seek to kill his son, He has no standing for this lawsuit to proceed. And as was most of the time the case throughout the war on terror, the federal judge in question in this circumstance ruled for the government. In practice, all this did was conceal like the effort that we could see unfolding, even if we couldn't get a meaningful picture of oversight 
um, or even just a basic glimpse um, beyond whispers and anonymous sources into this process that routinizes mass killing and considers that to be, as the euphemism went, targeted killing. In practice, this ended up allowing the CIA and the military to kill people who it didn't even know who they were mm. in the same way that previously the CIA tortured and rendered people that it didn't truly know who they were. This is a very ominous development. It's one that suggests eventually targeted killing against American citizens through drone strikes and possibly other mechanisms here on American soil may mm. indeed later on become you know, the next step taken in the war on terror if it's allowed to persist. And in that case, there will be a liberal legacy establishing that development. And, you know, in, in formulating this question, I had just have the word routinization question mark underlined in my notes, uh, which again, I, I think is one thing that I took from your book is just how processed uh, and routinized the war on terror became during the Obama administration. And you also, I think, make a, a point of you know, examining what might have happened or the opportunities that possibly existed after the Obama administration approved the killing of Osama bin Laden and, and, and killed him in 2011. There was this opportunity to dismantle some of these processes, uh, but that was an, an opportunity not taken. Yeah. So I, I mentioned early on in the book that one, you know, really big decision that you know, in the days after 9-11 that passes kind of unnoticed is a decision not to define the enemy. If you read the 60-word uh, September 2001 authorization to use military force, it's extremely vague about everything except one thing. And that one thing where it's very specific about is who wields this power. And the answer to that is the president. The president becomes a kind of elected king in matters of national security um, after 9-11. We can you know, have a, a debate with you know, people who are real historians and not you know, guys like me um, about whether that was already the case. And this is a codification or a ratification of that. But either way, the implication of this is that ultimately, if you don't define who the enemy is and you let a president decide who the enemy is, you will never be able to agree on when the task is finished. Or to put it a little differently, it will at the very least always be a matter of political contention. Different political forces will clash over whether the war is done or not. And that renders the end of the war as kind of laden with uh, political reality manipulation, deception, whatever you want to call it, as the operations of the war. And there's only really one opportunity in that kind of circumstance where you could conceive of a very, like as broad as would be possible, an accepted understanding of when the war has end it when, when it's wrapped up and when even you could argue America wins this thing, if that's what America needs to hear in order to be done with it. And that's the killing of Osama bin Laden. That's a circumstance where you can then directly say the person without whom none of this would have happened by none of this. I don't mean the war on terror because that's America's choice. I mean, the event of 9-11 that the war on terror then uses to, you know, like Athena burst out of you know, Zeus's head um, in existence and then take on a kind of life of its own. But Obama doesn't do that. And he doesn't do that because he's afraid that then he will be accused of having ended the war prematurely when that's another attack, when another attack happens. Even if another attack had happened, another attack will happen. Because we're talking about terrorism here. This isn't something you can eradicate. This is something you can manage and mitigate and choose your reaction to. But the Obama people kind of as, 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 a, 
and you know, not without reason. Like they 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 saw what happened ever since 9-11 when liberals, you know, to say nothing of leftists, um, argued for either a more restrained war on terror or an abolished, on the left at least, war on terror. And it was not, you know, pretty. And it was not, you know, consequence free. And th the right was willing uh, to use the full weight of the hysteria that it cultivated, which was always a nativist hysteria, regardless of how we now choose to remember uh, the Bush administration, against those who wanted you know, either restraint or abolition. So they're not coming out of this from nowhere. Certainly, you know, when Obama is in office, he's greeted by this like implacable white resistance. Um, so it's not like they, mm -hmm. they came up with any of this out of nowhere, but it's still nevertheless a choice that they make. Uh, they, they had the option of not just declaring an end to the war, but then arguing for it building a constituency for understanding why the war on terror had been such a disaster, why it has to be abolished, why it has to, you know, have the tools of it dismantled. And he doesn't do that. More remarkably, after the killing, he talks immediately about how these sorts of operations will persist that this is a milestone, but it's not the end. John Brennan, the morning after, gives a press conference where he reiterates this theme. They want to sound this, you know, you know, klaxon of uh, vigilance, sustainability, uh, rather than mark a departure. And, you know, what I hope readers get out of this when they get to that point in the book is that, like, can I go J.R.R. Tolkien for a bit on you? Uh, go for it, Gollum. So, like, the war on terror is the one ring. And, you know, this moment when uh, bin Laden is dead, you know, strikes me as the moment when, like, you know, Elrond, you know, king of the elves, um, and Isildur, uh, king of the humans, uh, goes into Mount Doom to finally destroy the ring. Like, that's like the Obama election. And the reader, I hope, who, is, who has read my depiction of the war on terror, what it is, what it represents, what it will do left alone and unchecked, in its implications, I hope, is Elrond, like screaming to Isildur, throw it in the fire, throw it in the fire. And instead, Isildur Obama, like looks at him like, but what could I do if I wielded it? Yeah. And I would wield it wisely. So you mentioned something earlier that I, I don't want to leave hanging. The idea mm -hmm. that perhaps one day in the future, the U.S. might approve drone strikes against American citizens on American soil. Now, that seems far-fetched right now. But one thing I think your book does absolutely brilliantly is describe how the architecture of the war on terror being used to prosecute and kill people abroad is, in fact, imported uh, into American society, American culture in really in important ways. And you title your chapter uh, describing the Trump administration's approach to the war on terror, something like the decadent phase of the war on terror. And, and part of that decadence, at least to me, is how the Trump administration was able to import uh, a lot of the war on terror and, and apply the ideas and even like the mechanisms against people here on American soil. Can you just sort of describe that process a bit? Yeah. And, you know, all of this stuff seems outlandish when discussed in its implication until it manifests. And the war on terror is a story across 20 years of how atrocity is normalized, how enormous, enormous lies that the CIA tells about both drone strikes and before that, and simultaneous to it in some cases, torture gets normalized, gets baked into the culture um, through, you know, propagandistic, you know, products, you know, like Zero Dark Thirty, or, you know, even without, you know, the collusion of the government, um, you know, show TV shows like 24, which is about you know, what a counterterrorist needs to do to keep you safe, even as you 
you know, pursue him with your lawyers and your civil liberties objections and all of these things that are meant to stop rough people from doing the rough stuff that needs to be done in the interests of justice. And, you know, consider what we saw last year. We saw the Trump administration tell the Justice Department and then the Attorney General instruct the Joint Terrorism Task Forces that unite FBI and local law enforcement around the country to target Antifa. And Antifa is not an organization. Antifa is an ethic. Antifa is a thing that people believe. That, not just language of terrorism, but the apparatus of counterterrorism was used on people in the United States who were out on the streets demanding justice. This was used against Black Lives Matter. None of this is new. The war on terror is channeling very old impulses in American history, ancient and recent, uh, mechanisms that Americans use uh, for native genocide in settling the West, like child separation, mechanisms of torture used uh, to enslave people and keep them and their children and their children's children enslaved, mechanisms of torture, mechanisms of terror, mechanisms that the United States uses in prior wars, like waterboarding in the Philippines, and then mechanisms that its security state uses at home and abroad uh, in the name of anti-communism throughout the Cold War. All of this is taken and channeled after the 9-11 attacks into processes that embed are, are embedded really deeply, very quickly in the security bureaucracy, as with the NSA and its uh, bulk surveillance programs over uh, Americans' communications. Um, that gets legalized in uh, 2008 in tremendous part and is now become symbiotic with 21st century capitalism, what the Harvard Business School professor emerita Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, uh, data capitalism. At this point, that's just kind of permanently symbiotic, um, ratified through law, ratified through uh, the federal judiciary that in most cases says, you can't do this, but most of this you can still do. And one of the reasons you can still do all of that is like, I'm uncomfortable substituting my judgment for uh, the president's in a time of national emergency. Once all of this happens, and of course I'm, I'm, you know, neglecting in the interests of, you know, having this conversation not go on forever, a tremendous amount of other, you know, applications we could talk about immigration and board and, um, and border and interior uh, security now viewing immigration in the context of a threat rather than in the context of a process of making more Americans. We could talk about that all day. We'll put that aside for a second. All of this normalizes horror. All of this normalizes processes that when you are looking to wield them against different internal enemies will be available and will not often be questioned. And when the former stewards of these processes as happened under Trump rise in opposition to you, oftentimes their opposition does not take the form of saying, we need to break these tools. It's the form of saying, we need to set real boundaries to only use these tools against these kinds of people and not those kinds of people. You know, reading your book just made me understand how the process of normalization of things like the surveillance state and the routine use of drone strikes abroad has, has become and how, you know, we don't even like, you know, think twice about it these days. Like we've acquiesced to it, but I'm old enough. And, and I know you are too, to like, remember a time when 
it, this wasn't normal when the you know use of military force abroad was the subject of like a, a major debate. You know, people listening to this podcast, you know, they're kind of in the foreign policy community, so they're probably aware that earlier uh, last month the Biden administration launched two drone strikes in Somalia. But the general public isn't, and there was never any like big debate about whether or not you know, using drone strikes in support of American trained forces against Al-Shabaab was like a prudential use of, of American power, was it was an American national interest. Like these debates just don't happen. And that's just like what your book made me realize. Like this, this has all just become normal now. And I just wonder how we get back to a place where something like a drone strike in Mali or Somalia or Niger is the something like the subject of, of like a major you know, political debate about American foreign policy. Like, how do we get there? Well, you know, think about Somalia even beyond those drone strikes. The United States has been at war in Somalia directly or indirectly long enough for that war to have had a bat mitzvah. <laughs> We don't talk about that at all. We simply accept it. It, it, it is, you know, beyond even background noise. I, 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 the way I put it in the book is that, like, you know, you could say at different points, Afghanistan or Iraq is the forgotten war. But you can't say that about Somalia because no one focused on it to forget it. It, it is simply an exercise of the security state and no one else. I you know, also report in the book that like, if you ask relevant congressional committees, like, so like, could I see studies that you've done of the war in Somalia? They don't exist. Like there's no real congressional oversight over this. There's no interest in congressional oversight over this. There's no upside in congressional oversight over this. I, I take a, very dour view of like the robustness of American democracy. Um, even at times when it seems like that democracy is strong because like what we have is bourgeois democracy. Like it's not very democratic in resting circumstances. Um, we have over the security apparatus. I think it's fair to say like, the barest simulacrum of democracy and in practice, no democracy at all. Um, we have only like the degree to which elected officials uh, feel the need to weigh in on this or that operation. And very often not from the perspective of pursuing abolition. And that I think is, is where an answer to your question begins. You know, the way you get out of a circumstance in which such atrocity is so routinized and so normalized, there's only one way. You have to organize. You have to force what limited democratic accountability still exists over your elected officials and the people they appoint in order to get them to break the tools of the war on terror without doing any of that. And it's a tremendously tall order all of this will persist. The forever war will continue. It will move ever onward toward this final form of domestic destabilization that we may not soon see, but it sure is a whole huge candy store full of opportunities for authoritarians. And we just got a reminder over the last four years of what those authoritarians want to do. What do you think they'll want to do next now that they feel that an election has been stolen from them? Well, Spencer, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. The book is brilliant. Uh, one of the, the best foreign policy books I've read in a very, very long time. I hope it wins all the awards. It should win all the awards. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It's great to have this kind of conversation with an old friend. Yeah, you know, not not to belabor us, but I I you know have followed your work since the early two thousands when we we're just kind of coming up in in journalism together, and I could say in retrospect you were destined to write this book. Well, that thank you very much. All right, thank you all for listening. Thank you to Spencer for speaking with me, but more importantly for changing how I think about the war on terror in this 
really vitally important book. I hope it wins all the awards, as I said at the end. It deserves. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.